Hola, you are listening to First Gen Healing, a podcast on Latinx healing and awakening journeys. My name is Priscila Luna. I am your host. And you guys, excited for today's episode. We have a beautiful Latina astrologist. Cara, welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy and excited to have you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm so excited to be here. Huge fan of your work and all of the people that you get to interview. So just so grateful to hold space with you. Yay! This part, part one, I definitely want the audience to get to know you a little bit more, get to know your story before we dive into part two, which will be more of like your area of expertise. So if you can give us a little snapshot maybe of your upbringing, your cultura, that we would love to hear. So I'm actually not first gen. Um, I'm Mexican American and I was born and raised in Texas. Okay. And so my, my dad's from like a border town um, uh, South Texas. Mm. And my mom is at like one of seven. It's like a big Catholic family. And so um, growing up, I think they were all really close. My mom's mom passed when they were really young, and so I think it just really solidified that, like, growing up in a matriarch, my tias really, like, took over and kind of, you know, took care of everyone and just brought in that, like, ancestral healing. So that was always, like, you know, representation for me growing up to see, you know, these strong women speaking up and taking care of everyone and, you know, sharing that wisdom of our ancestors. I was probably like eight years old whenever they sat me down and, you know, started to cast my astrology birth chart with me. And so they would always talk about like astral projection and dreaming and having visions of the future or connecting with people who have passed. So I really appreciate kind of growing up with that magic and Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how rare it was too because they were Catholic. When I share that story, people are like, oh, like my family was too Catholic to kind of, you know, share Mm -hmm. that magic. And I was like, that's so interesting because my tias were so Catholic. But I think like through that route, you know, there's a a lot of similarities and just like honoring our indigenous roots, you know, tracking Mm -hmm. the stars, working with plants and the seasons and healing with nature. So that was always, you know, shown to me from a young age. And I think that's whenever I kind of realized we all have access to it within us, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not just, um, yeah, I think we all have access to that magic, to that healing, to that wisdom. Wow. You mentioned like you're not first gen. So do you say that because your parents were born in the U.S.? Right, yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so then you're technically second gen is what I'm assuming. Well, um, I think my dad's grandparents were the mm-hmm. ones who came over and same with my mom. So maybe, okay. yeah. And then the second question I had for you is you mentioned your dad was from a border town. What about your mom? Is she also Mexican or from a Mexican lineage? Yeah, both of them are. And so my mom's, uh, my mom was from a really small town in Texas. And we actually don't have a lot of history about, you know, where or when her family came over. Mm -hmm. Uh, My dad's kind of done some work to try to pinpoint like, you know, where and when and who um so yeah it's um but both are mexican i see okay and then how crazy that at the age of eight you were introduced to some of this yeah (laughs) is it like was it your mom and your tias or was it just your tias like that was you and tias time how did how did that actually play out Yeah, so it was definitely my tias, and so my tias are older, and my tias kind of feel like my grandmas, you know? Mm. They were just like the head of the matriarch, and so they would tell me stories about their tias as well, and, you know, talking about like ojo, like energy work, healing with energy work, and, you know, our eyes carry energy, so, you know, they were just always talking about what might not seem normal to people, you know? And 
the ability to like heal with crystals and see our auras and practicing seeing our auras and so you know this was like in the 90s like you know before we had like the apps on our phone to kind of show us um, our birth chart for example so like whenever they sat me down they used this like big old book and it's like an ephemeris so we like cast my birth chart by hand and that's you know when they started to be like oh you're passionate like you should be more passionate and oh, you're curious, like you should ask more questions. And I think coming from a religious upbringing, like that's not always the message that we hear, you know? So yeah. being like empowered to use my voice and to speak up and to ask questions was definitely something like my tias, you know, brought in. And mm -hmm. I think my mom was so young. My mom was almost a little scared of that magic and those powers and, you know, being able to hear certain things or see certain things so it was more so like my eldest dia my dia gelda she was the spiritual healer she brought in the crystals but the books and all of that so i think it you know kind of trickled down from her and and even like their dias you know mm. that is so interesting and i love how you mentioned too like that they were catholic because i know that fellow for like first gens who tune in sometimes have that um maybe they run up against that right like the taboo of being even interested in crystals and healing and energy work and maybe having that thought in their mind like this is, this is the diablo right or like don't don't open those portals and things like that was it taboo like was it something that even though they were catholic you guys kept to your household or was it something that they were open about with others they were actually open about it with others like thinking about it you know i hear stories about like people in the town coming mm -hmm. to my um, my older my, my guess my great dia um you know people in the town would come to her and ask questions about like what's to come or you know working with healing and just like secrets and things like that so it wasn't just kept to our household it was very normal and i didn't realize that it was rare until i got older and started to like talk to people and share those things and they were like yeah. oh wow you know but it was very and then even they passed down like some books to me and so even whenever i was really young mm -hmm. like i was always like looking at the charts of friends and like looking at like compatibility or synastry and just like always had my crystals so yeah it was very something we would share mm -hmm. super interesting okay well do you think you know knowing now that you're a couple generations down let's say do you think that that played a part in your experience in terms of mm, feeling like from one place or the other, you know, because I think like for first gens, it's very fresh <laughs> or that's what it feels like, like, oh, so no eres aquí ni de allá. Do you think because it's a couple of generations down that that helps? Yeah, I feel like it's definitely a privilege to, you know, hold space and to like self-actualize. And so mm -hmm. I think that being connected to those roots and those lineages, like it's a privilege to heal our ancestors like the work that we're doing isn't just us it's the ancestors who came before us and most of my clients are first gen and i think it's really important to use whatever our healing modalities or tools are but to have representation to that those roots and there are certain placements that feel far from home or feeling like you don't fully belong here or you don't fully belong there. And like, for me, I wasn't raised speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. And that, like, I carry so much shame around that, you know, because I want to be able to, you know, speak Spanish confidently. And yeah. while I can understand and while I'm working on it and I'm surrounded by so many beautiful Spanish speakers, you know, it, I almost kind of feel like I'm not enough to fit in here, but I'm definitely not, but, you know, I don't fit in in other realms too. So yeah. I think talking about it and removing shame and like finding community to hold that with because, I, you know, it, it can feel so isolating, but I feel whenever I actually have the courage to share that with people, that like we exist, 
you know, and yeah. it doesn't mean that we're less of anything. You know, our culture is still, you know, very apparent, and maybe it's in other ways, but, you know, removing shame, having those conversations, creating community, and, like, celebrating those differences, you know, being yeah. able to hold it in community rather than just isolating. Mm, yeah, I love that, finding community around it. And it takes people stepping, stepping up and talking about it, right? Yeah, and to think too, like, why? Why is that? And it's because whenever, you know, they came to Texas, they weren't allowed to speak Spanish in places, or they would be beat, you know? And so there was, I think, a fear in if I didn't speak perfect Spanish, I would be bullied like they were, or not allowed to certain places. So, you know, whether we're aware of it or not, you know, these, you know, things show up in our life. And for me, being born and raised in Texas, you know, I am so grateful that there are so many, you know, Latinx people around me here. But I actually moved to Portland, Oregon whenever I was 21. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're familiar with Portland, Oregon, but for a long time, I don't know if it still is, but it was like the whitest city per capita. And so whenever I moved so far from home and I didn't know anyone there, I noticed, oh, wow, I'm never accidentally in a room full of Latinas or, you know, I'm never accidentally like having conversations. I had to realize, oh, I have to go out of my way. And that's where I realized, like, the power of celebrating our culture and finding our people. It's so healing yeah. to be surrounded by it. And so that's what I did um, in Portland. I found, like, a woman of color book club. And that, I think, really sustained my journey in Portland. Um, so I'm so grateful for that awareness to kind of reach and go out of my way to build community and celebrate our culture. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as you're speaking, I think you made me think about how um, there's so many phases to it. Like, there's so many phases to how we get to exist in the U.S., let's say. Because I think about those who are still undocumented. And so potentially this liberation of, like, owning who you are is still not accessible to them, right? It still is a privilege because like you mentioned, like there are potential repercussions to really shining and being authentic and yourself and maybe even speaking Spanish. Like you have to be under the radar in some way, right? And then um, then maybe like gaining like those who are citizens here and that's a whole other like experience. And then also down the line, right? Down the generations, that's another experience as well of like reclaiming your roots and finding a balance of who you are and how, how to exist, right? In this duality, essentially. Yeah. yeah, I know. It like almost just like brings me to tears, just, you know, having the privilege to have this conversation and to be seen, you know, it's not easy and it doesn't come naturally, but like putting yourself out there, that's where you find your people. That's where you see, okay, wow, if like they can do it, then I can do it. And we get to share, you know, our magic and it's different for us all. But like, you know, using your podcast as a platform, like, that is healing generations before us that like we couldn't even imagine. And doing the work that I do in astrology, finding those things in the chart and celebrating them rather than just using like colonizer astrology and ignoring those differences, you know. Mm -hmm. There are placements that show we feel far from home. Maybe we're healers, but yet we feel the inability to heal ourselves. Mm, yeah. I can't wait to talk about that. Okay. <laughs> but as you know, this podcast is on healing and awakening journeys. So would love to know what you resonate with most or both. And we can start off maybe with like the first instance or clue, like awareness maybe that you needed to heal or that you were awakening. Mm, I love this so much. And for me, it's the healing journey. I think it's a privilege to heal and to feel safe and have the, you know, awareness to heal from certain things. And so my healing journey, I like to think started when I was 21. And so when I was 21, I moved to Portland and I didn't know anyone there. And I took a long road trip from Texas to Oregon to get there. 
and I was also heartbroken and, you know, just like the perfect little mix to, um, you know, go on that healing journey. And when I got to Portland, I finally found the space to become without any, you know, limiting beliefs that weren't even mine to carry, you know. Mm -hmm. And so having that space to heal in nature, because as much as I love Texas, you know, nature isn't as accessible and, you know, the weather, but in Portland, nature is everywhere. There are so many parks, there's the coast, there's the mountain, there's the desert, there's all of these places that, you know, it's just natural to find yourself in nature there. Mm -hmm. And I think doing so, I realized, oh, I am just, you know, a very small part in something so much bigger and connecting with the seasons and the elements and, you know, rain and releasing and then being reborn and understanding that, you know, we're not, it's, we're not always going to be producing. There are times when, you know, it's fall and winter and then spring comes and it's a time for rebirth. And so that's just where I felt more freedom to take this, you know, all this wisdom from my ancestors and continue that journey to heal and to be aware of karmic patterns that kept playing out. Um, so I say that's when my healing journey and awareness really began. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is how it correlates with astrology. Like, I would love to, like, look at the charts of everyone you've ever interviewed and look at the dates when they have their healing journey and their spiritual awareness. Because, um, you know, our birth chart starts with the screenshot of the sky when we were born and the sun moon rising and then we get into the planets and the houses but what a lot of people forget is that the planets keep moving mm -hmm. and so we experience these transits all of us at certain ages based off of how the planets move and so I know we're going to get into talking about the Saturn return, which is so popular. Everyone always talks about it, but really understanding what that means. And I noticed looking at my chart when I was 21, I was having a Saturn transit. And it's the feeling of, you know, feeling restricted and having to, you know, choose yourself, be aware of your decisions and the impact they have. So yeah, it's just really interesting to see how the current transits play a role in our healing or spiritual awakening, and mm -hmm. it's just so fascinating. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So you went to Oregon, uh, where, like you mentioned, nature is everywhere, and I connect with that so much because two years ago, a little over two years ago, I moved to Tennessee, which from california to tennessee and tennessee there's nature everywhere too and you get to see the seasons right We're interesting because yeah it gives you a visual right visual representation of cycles and how every season has its purpose when you moved out there was that the intention like when you when you decided oregon what were you kind of healing from was it specifically the breakup what what was kind of like um going through your mind in those moments? Such a good question. And, you know, um, so I, th I think I've always been really into crystals, really into astrology, you know, celebrating that from my ideas. But the thing is, like, a lot of people in my family took the traditional path of going to college and, you know, getting that 401k or what have you, whatever they're selling. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when it when it came to me, and, you know, some people in my family were like, get a finance degree, be an accountant. I was like, over my dead body. <laughs> like, <laughs> couldn't be me. Just it yeah. literally couldn't happen. That's not how I learn. That's not who I am. And so that was really hard to kind of push against that tradition um, that they connected to safety and to security. Yeah. So, you know, they fought really hard. My dad was, you know, um, and his brothers were the first in their family to get the college degree. And so they thought that this would save them, that this was the solution. And then it's a privilege that I was able to say, uh, I can't, I don't learn in that way. That's not who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I was kind of offered, you know, go to college, get the finance degree and 
you know, we'll work with you. And I was like, actually, I'm going to pursue film Mm. and I'm going to pursue music. And I would do um, like uh, video work for bands. And so I graduated high school when I was 16 because I just like had to get out of there. And then I started community college. And that's when I was like, I can't continue on this path. Like, it's not me. And so I realized there are other places where who I am is celebrated. And it felt like the West Coast was one of those places. And so as much as I love Austin here, I have a lot of family in Austin. Austin's so cool. But it didn't feel far enough. And I felt like Portland was very similar to Austin, but further. And so what's funny is that it was, I I had a boyfriend at the time and he was the one who was like, you would love Portland, like, you know, this and that. And I was like, sure, anywhere. Like, I don't care anywhere, just not here. And then, you know, through a very interesting journey that I won't get too deep in, but just like everything wrong that could happen, happened. Involving like car accidents, people going to jail, just a really, you know, gnarly situation. It put me in a position to realize, okay, like I have to go to Portland for myself and alone. I can't wait for anyone else. This is something that I need to do. And so I went to Portland alone and I was healing through the sense of my boyfriend who I had been with for a while ended up with my best friend. And so it's like, I'm grateful that that happened and put me on a path to choose myself. And, but it's heartbreaking in the moment, you know, when you trust your best friend and you trust your boyfriend and they're like, you know, the two main people in your, you know, social circle and I, right. And then they're no more to you. And so that was something, you know, I really felt like not only did I move to Portland, but I also didn't really have a home to go back to. And so it was kind of like, make it or break it. Like I had to put everything I have into this because this is my home now. And then I'm so grateful because I realized, okay, I'm only letting people in my circle who I trust, who I can see their true character. And so, you know, ultimately I think I'm better off for it, realizing those things Um, But it wasn't easy, especially at 21. Um, And so I was able, I was actually working for Urban Outfitters at the time. And so I was able to transfer from Texas to Oregon. So I was able to go with the job. And then like everyone who worked there, this was like 2013, no one was from Portland. So we were all kind of like a makeshift family. And I think that really helped start to kind of, you know, make friends, push myself out of my comfort zone. So I'm super grateful that that's where I ended up. And then, you know, I had a little community from where I was working. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how I got to Portland. And then I I stayed for 10 years. Wow. And so just a couple months ago, did I decide, like, maybe I want to spend more time in Texas because I'm a Dia now and I have a nephew. Mm. And so just kind of celebrating family with who I am now, you know, now that I've become, wow. that's how I got there. Mm, okay. So interesting. Yeah, I think at 21, those feel like huge betrayals because those are like the main characters in your life. <laughs> oh, my goodness. When you felt that like, okay, then this is the route I have to go by myself, was it guided by intuition? Do you feel like you were already really connected to that part of you? Was it guided by like your birth chart? Like what um, what gave you that impulse? Because 21 is young to be like, let's do this. I got this on my own, you know? You know what's funny is that maybe it's having grown up in Texas, but for me, I always thought maybe it's the movies I was watching, the books I was reading, but I always knew that I was going to get out of Texas. That was never a question. Mm, It was just when. Like, I I never felt, like, truly safe or, like, I truly belonged here. And so I always knew. I mean, I kind of, when I was super young, I would have assumed California, you know, because we see it so much in, like, pop culture. Um, But I was open to where just as long as it wasn't here. So I think I always knew that. Mm -hmm. But then 
learning more about Portland, I was like, oh, this is a vibe. This is, you know, it's weird. I'm weird. It's celebrated <laughs> to be yourself and be unique. And so it really just made sense. And then um, I was always a road tripper. I was always a traveler. And like you said, maybe it's a little bit of my birth chart too, because um, I'm a Sagittarius rising and that is the traveler. And so like ever since I could drive, I would road trip to LA or road trip to Florida and like sleep on the beach or like sleep in my car. Like I definitely wasn't doing it with, you know, means, but I was like, I have enough for gas and I can like make sandwiches in the car, you know? (laughs) So I always wanted to see the world and get out. I think it kind of runs in my family to be a bit of a traveler. Mm. I love also um, how you mentioned, I want to go where I'm celebrated, I think is how you said it. And I don't think that sometimes, unfortunately, we have that awareness that that's that's kind of the route we can take rather than changing who we are. And I wonder how did you like come into the knowing of like there are places that would celebrate me or that where I would fit in as opposed to I don't fit in. I need to change who I am. What's so funny is like that's definitely my birth chart. And I see this in so many of my clients' birth charts. It's not a choice. Like, I'm sure if it was, we would choose to conform. That would be easy. That would be safe. Oh, sure. But why not? But the thing is, like, there's some things in some of our birth charts that it's, like, it's literally impossible. And so, like, I've always, you know, struggled with authority. And, you know, so I see these patterns not only in my chart, but in the clients who come to me. And then so it's an opportunity for me to say, good job. Yeah, be more of yours. Like like my Diaz did with me. They were like, you're passionate. Speak up more. And so, like, you know, finding those, you know, unique energies in the chart and celebrating them because it does lead us on our path. And if we live for someone else other than ourselves ultimately the Saturn return catches up to us and that's where it's where we learn like we actually have to live for ourselves we can't be living for other people's hopes and dreams it has to be in alignment with our path yeah yeah (laughs) the Saturn return (laughs) it's so funny to see how the Saturn return plays out for everyone because you know it can be in a different sign it can be in a different house But it just shows. And, you know, there are some people who try to listen and try to say, okay, I'll get the degree. That'll, you know, that'll put Mm. me in a safe space, right, if possible. And then so they make these decisions and they live, you know, based off those decisions. And then sometimes it's, you know, when you're 28 to 30 and you start to have the Saturn return and the world just starts falling apart. And that's when you realize, oh, I don't have a choice. Like, I have to live for myself. I have to make decisions for me. But also, that's a privilege because yeah. some of my clients are having their second Saturn return and they're realizing things that they wish they would have had the awareness of, you know, in their late 20s. Yeah. And so, yeah, just having the space to self-actualize is a privilege and yeah. reflect on your Saturn and how it works for you and in this world. Mm-hmm. And I love, I think, like, it gives the, um, for example, this episode gives just, like, a different perspective because you're right. Sometimes we don't have that space between, let's say, generations. So if our parents immigrated here and the sacrifices seem so close to the life that we're living, then it feels like it's directly tied and it's a responsibility to make them proud or make their sacrifices worth it, right? Which is something that we hold very proudly but for example me in my Saturn return I had to let go of and that can be really hard and it can feel like betrayal essentially to our family units um, and so I kind of like that in in your experience for example you do have some of that distance between that experience um, because it provides just a different aspect of it you know how like potentially why it can be so hard I'm not saying your experience wasn't, by the way, but I'm just saying, like, it feels very personal, let's say, when we're so closely tied to that immigration story, you know, or to that experience, or some some of the listeners, too, did it themselves, you know, so, like, they came here with their family, and they remember living in their country, so it's, um, it feels very personal to their parents' experience sometimes, the shift, the empowerment of doing their own thing. 
Yeah. And what's funny is like, those are the people that I surround myself with. Those are who I'm here for. You know, I do this work to help others on that journey. And sometimes you, like you said, like, you know, I'm a couple generations in and I feel like, you know, there are people in my family who have forgotten where we come from. And it's like, you know, conforming isn't going to save us. They actually don't care about us. Like, that's not, you know. Mm -hmm. And so seeing people make those decisions and go through that path and then still not being taken care of, it's like, okay, so we the American dream is a sham. It's like a whole scam. It's an MLM. And so <laughs> being <laughs> no, like that. <stop>. <laughs> I heard, I heard someone oh say, God. like, America is just three corporations in a t- trench coat. <laughs> and, like, so true, you know? And so, see, like, you know, being a couple generations in and seeing how it plays out and seeing, like, you know what? Actually, no, my loyalties lie with my people. Mm-hmm. And, you know, going back to my roots and using my privilege and my awareness to celebrate and make safe spaces for my people, mm-hmm. I think that's... I, yeah, something that I've really taken away. And it is through privilege. And, you know, having been here for a couple of generations, like a lot of people in my close circle um, are, you know, first gen or they've migrated here, you know, themselves. And they feel like, you know, they have to take care of everyone. And yeah. so, like, you know, restructuring that framework and, like, what's actually sustainable mm-hmm. and what boundaries can we have to support us? Yeah. And just, you know, learning more to, like, share those resources and, you know, honor that resiliency that comes with that story. Yeah. I'm glad that we're seeing through the illusion, you know, that's kind of what's happening. And um, hopefully that lends way for a lot of healing moving forward. It's really cool that, like, you're already embodying the change in a way, you know, like embodying the change that we wish we saw with more people who do have that privilege. Yeah. And, you know, my ideas used to say that like privilege is holding the door open behind you. It's getting into those rooms where dis- decisions are being made and then holding the door behind you so other people like us can get in and be in on the conversation. But then I think about it. And of course, I see this through astrology. I actually don't want to sit at that table anymore because mm-hmm. I see people over there aren't eating. And so I'm not going to sit at this table and conform and, you know, survive based off my proximity to whiteness when those people over there aren't eating. And I have systems and tools and resources that I can go build a table over there rather than coming in here and, yeah, you know. Yeah. So maybe to lead us into part two, where we're going to talk about like specifically astrology, let's say, what was like the turning point where you decided to make it your livelihood, you know, or a big part of your life? Can you walk us through that kind of journey? Yes. Okay. I feel like like, I see the patterns in, you know, in everything. And so just to to mention what is a Saturn return for those who are like, wait, what's that? Basically, we have our birth chart and it's Mm -hmm. the screenshot of this guy when we were born. And we start with the intro of the rising sign, the constellation rising when we took our first breath. Where was the moon? Oh, that's what you need. That's how you nurture your emotions. Where was the sun? That's your life force, your identity. And then we have these planets. And the planet that was furthest out visually was Saturn. So clocking Saturn's Mm -hmm. transits as a timing technique is really impactful. Like it always hits every time I bring up that, you know, when we were born, Saturn was in a sign and it stays in a sign for three and a half years. So when we're about like seven to nine, we have the first Saturn square to our birth Saturn square. And so that's tension and obstacle, and we can all point to something that happened in our life that was like, oh, dang, yeah, that really did kind of kick in some way. Like every time, you know, we think of that trauma or what have you. And then when we're about like 14, 15, we have the Saturn opposition. And then when we're about like 21 to 23, depending on Saturns and Saturn retrogrades, 
we have the final square before our Saturn return. So for me, whenever I was 21, I was having that Saturn square that, you know, I was like opposing or I had a problem with authority. I couldn't just conform. It wasn't in the cards for me. So I knew that, that I always had to take my own path. And mm -hmm. then from being, you know, 21, having that Saturn square, Saturn is boundaries and restriction, but it can feel a lot like depression when we experience these Saturn transits and how they show up for us. And so knowing that it's not forever and that, you know, it's a season, whatever it looks like for your chart. Um, but I knew that I was in my Saturn square when I moved to Portland and it's tension and it's obstacle, but I say it's like whenever you're swimming underwater and you push off the wall to go further. So you ultimately go further from these tensions and obstacles, you know, just now having that awareness. And so then cue my Saturn return at 28. And I had, I, I had always been a traveler, right? Like that was something that just like, I wanted to see how people lived all over the world cultures, languages, I think, you know, celebrating those things is so important. And I did a lot of traveling and I always worked up at whatever company I was with. And so I found myself in a tech job at 28. And let's just say it was for a travel app company. And I was like, okay, this is safety and security, right? Like, this is what I was told. Get that job, get that 401k, get the social security, whatever all those things are. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I should be taken care of, right? Like, now I just work until I retire, and that's the plan. Okay. And it was always like, yep, <laughs> no, not <laughs> wild <we> card. <laughs> And, you know, through that experience, and that's where I was like, you know, holding the door open for others and... I realized, oh, wow, I'm actually not being valued or paid equally. Mm. And I had to fight for justice and I had to fight for equality. And it, it, that was the first time that people weren't on my side about it. Like I had always been in groups where people were like, yes, equality, yes, justice, yes, let's make this right. And that was the first time that the people ahead of me were like, no. And I'm like, what, what do you mean no? Like, this is, <laughs> this is like justice. Yeah. So, so that was the first time kind of learning that, you know, this isn't going to save me. And, you know, I had some experiences that kind of brought up PTSD and, you know, creating like a safe space to express myself. And so through all of that trauma, I really couldn't, feel I couldn't see the light at the end of the tunnel I didn't know how I was going to continue in that space I was yeah. told this was where I was supposed to be and then I got here and I had to fight to be valued equally and yeah. so that was March of 2020 wow okay and so right and so at first we started working from home but working for a travel lab company a lot of people were reaching out trying to cancel their mm -hmm. reservations or what have you you know so at f i was grateful to be able to work from home for a couple of months because it felt impossible to continue to go put myself in that environment it just f truly was impossible and so being able to work from home, I kind of had the space to go back to energy healing, go back to, you know, healing with nature. Um, and then they did mass layoffs. They closed the headquarters in Portland. And so with that, I had never had my own laptop before. And so when they did mass layoffs, they allowed us to keep our laptops. And that's the laptop mm. that I'm talking to you on right now. Wow. And yeah, so I knew that that was an opportunity and a privilege to now have this resource. And so mm. that's when I was like, okay, well, I'm going to study energy healing. I'm going to start to take courses that, you know, teach me how to hold space and then when doing so, I realized that I was my first client. And so for a year, all I did was take care of myself. I worked on, you know, my own energy healing and my own practice. And, you know, it wasn't until my Dia passed away. And I realized 
it feels so, you know, alone when, you know, your family passes. It's like, oh no, I no longer have that bridge or that connection to that wisdom. Mm. But we do, it's within us. It's within our bones. It's, you know, within everything within us. And so when my Thea passed and I was on this healing journey, I felt more connected to her than ever before. And I felt more sure that there was something bigger and this connection was still there, whether it was through hearing things. Like that was the first time that I started to hear my Thea's. And that, you know, you look around and you're like, oh, that's a new one. Like, I think I always had an inner knowing, like, clear cognizance. Like, I just knew things. Like, I'd be knowing stuff. But that oh, was the first okay. time that it grew to, like, hearing things. And mm. oh, I just, it, you know, it gives me chills thinking about it. Um, and then I realized, you know, I was a Thea. And so it was my turn to bring the crystals and to bring out the astrology book and to help others through this journey. And then of course I realized, you know, 2020 wasn't easy for anyone. So everyone was moving through grief. Everyone was moving through isolation. And so using my laptop and sharing my story, I feel like a lot of people came to me and, you know, just really identified with it and would ask like, can you look at my birth chart? And of course, I was like, yes, like it's my favorite thing in the world to do, like get over here. And so being able to see, oh, you're this, oh, you should, that, yeah, like, you know, celebrating those things rather than thinking like, we should all be the same, it's all this or that, you know, finding those aspects, it's so layered. And so, you know, during 2020, my ideas started to pass and I, you know, over the last couple of years, I've lost three of my ideas who have passed away. And so just working with grief is a big, yeah. you know, root of my work and seeing it in the birth chart. And so that's when I started to notice, oh, there's a need for this. Maybe I can make like a calendar, you know, so people can just book with me and they can book with me. And so I did it for free for a long time, just, you know, wanting to get to read a hundred people's charts, you know. Mm. And then I realized, you know, as certain things were kind of dwindling down. I was like, I think I want to offer some type of structure. People want to pay me and I need to let go of my fear of money and Mm -hmm. finances and allow people to pay me. And so my idea was to provide a sliding scale. And so people could choose what they would pay me. And that's where you know, it started to really take off that I was able to pay my bills with the work that I was doing. Mm. Wow, what a story for it's, such transitions and huge ones in the last couple of years for you. First of all, shout out to your Diaz. Oh, that's so crazy that like, do you feel like it was like a passing of the baton in a way? I love that. I love that so much. And even like before my Thea passed, um, I remember I was in Portland and I was really obsessed. I've always been obsessed with auras, but then I got obsessed Mm -hmm. with like being able to have our auras photographed. Mm -hmm. And so there's these old cameras that kind of pick up the light. And so I would, I was really into having my aura photographed. And before my Thea passed, I would send her photos of my aura And so she was working as a spiritual healer in Sedona. And so she would send me crystals. And so I have one, it's tattooed on me now um, for, you know, when she passed. But I feel like, you know, that's kind of like a passing of the baton. Like she would share these tools and these herbal remedies and how to practice seeing your aura and, you know, holding out your hand in front of like a white wall and just, you know, staring at it to start to see those layers and those colors. And so I'm really grateful that I feel like the baton passing happened, you know, before she passed. Mm -hmm. But then when she passed, I realized this is bigger than me. People need this, you know, connection, this tool. And so how can I share it, you know, in honor of her? And I think working through scarcity and working through, you know, maybe people in my family not thinking that I could be successful taking this path. Um, That's where I had to kind of, you know, let go of some of those limiting beliefs and really like 
go full throttle, just be myself unapologetically and, you know, expand and have these conversations and be seen because I have a fear of being seen. I have a fear of being hurt. And I think a lot of us do for a lot of different reasons, but I think that's just our ego, you know? So Mm. knowing that the work that we're here to do is bigger than us. And so, you know, putting that aside and making space to have these conversations is why we're here. Yeah. (laughs) So interesting how a lot of us work through that, even though we're showing up, even though we're speaking up, we're working hard in the background, like through those fears and like, yeah, it's so it's so interesting how that's a part of the process, you know, for a lot of us um, who feel like we are in a way creating something that is bigger than us. And sometimes we can't necessarily see the big picture like it appears as we go. Um, but super cool that a lot of us are kind of following that nudge, like, okay, I don't know what this, what this is going to turn into, but I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you have to remember, like, it hasn't always been safe to be seen. It's still not always safe to be seen. So making space for that and hearing, like, where do I feel that in the body? Where does that come up for me? And, you know, I was listening to your last podcast about, you know, Yvonne and public speaking, and that really helped, too, just, you know, hearing her story and her tools that she shares. I started following her on TikTok and just, you know, having that awareness to think, when did this fear start to be seen and, you know, to be heard and just kind of, you know, working through it also somatically in the body and their dreams just like on every level. Mm hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you, um, well, actually, if it's okay with you, I would like to shout out my deal because I feel like, (laughs) and I I was like, I'm going to cry a little bit, but I just think like, it's so crazy that we connected and that this is like your story. And, you know, as I'm hearing that they pass and now you're taking it on and like owning it, you know, oh, sorry. (laughs) I kind of knew I was going to get a little emotional. But we talked on, I think it was, yeah, TikTok Live, where I was like, oh, I have a tío. And um, my tío was an astrologist in Venezuela. Yeah. (laughs) And um, it's so crazy because, like, he came into our lives kind of at a turbulent time when my parents were about to divorce. But he didn't Mm -hmm. tell us that. He just said, like, you guys are about to go through a couple of really hard years And I just want you to know that I'm here. And then um, he said three years, three really hard years. And it's crazy because um, first, like, I had my big breakup with my, like, forever boyfriend that I thought I was going to marry. And then two months later, my parents get divorced out of nowhere. And then um, cue in, like, everything falling apart around me, kind of like my spiritual awakening. And I went through that depression feeling phase, right? Where you feel like nothing makes sense anymore. Like you're seeing through the veil a little bit. And he would just call me from Venezuela and be like, like, I wouldn't answer. He would just call like five times until I answered through WhatsApp, you know, like, mija, como estas? And um, I opened up finally to him in a moment where I wasn't talking to my dad for like, I didn't talk to him for two years because he you know, left to Texas, actually. <laughs> mm-hmm. And um, yeah, and my uncle, I think, w- wanted to be that presence for me. And so I opened up a little bit of, and he knew exactly what a spiritual awakening was. And he gave me language to the things that I was experiencing and feeling. And um, it was so cool. It was so cool to be seen and validated in those moments that felt so strange. Um, but he used astrology to kind of like guide me through and talk me through it all and kind of planted that seed. And then I think I've mentioned it on the podcast, but literally within that year, like, which was the end of the three years that he said would be really hard, he passed away. Mm. Yeah. So So he, like my grandma passed away two months actually before him and then he did. Um, so like, we feel like she kind of took him with, with her, um, But yeah, I don't know. I I wanted to share that story because when I hear you talk about your tias, I'm like, oh, I have my astrology tio too. And I feel like he planted a lot of, I don't know, he just gave me words and that allowed me to continue. And then I think in some way I'm like 
embodying part of him you know that is a hundred percent I mean like making space to have these conversations and then to become the dias and dios who get to bring in that magnificent healing you know it's within our ancestors it's it's just like within our roots, you know, following the pattern of the stars. And it's been done for thousands of years. Like, I've checked the data, okay? Like, it can't be denied. <laughs> and to have these conversations is how we remember them. And so I'm just so grateful to, you know, have this space and celebrate them. And I know I always feel this way, that they're cheering us on. Like, in this mm. moment, we just can't see everything. But they're here, and they're like, and say this. Tell them this. Mm. Bring it up, you know? And we don't know <laughs> why, but we're like, okay, like, I'm going to bring this up. And then the other person's like, same. Like, that's, you know, and it's, yeah, it's, we all need that, you know? And it's an honor to have it, you know? We had it for so long and, you know, helped us on our path. But now we get to help other people who are carrying it and, you know, a little bit younger to people who are having their Saturn returns now. You know, it's like, I think yeah. that's the passing of the baton is once, you know, we go through these Saturn transits. And it's not just the Saturn return of when you're like 28 to 30, but it's the Saturn squares. It's the Saturn oppositions. There's all these times where Saturn continues to move and impact us. And that three years that you mentioned that your Theo said is a Saturn transit. Saturn stays in a sign for three years. So I'm sure he saw Saturn making an aspect to some natal things in a certain house and could knew what that meant. I also heard Saturn called like Father Time because Saturn represents time. Mm. But Saturn also represents m mortality and where we start to learn, oh, we're all gonna die. And that's not like so goth or emo, like it's just, you know, the natural progression of life. But we have to start, you know, living in alignment with that. Mm, wow. One last question before uh, I ask you like resources. Do you feel like because your aunts embraced this, was there financial scarcity that they actually experienced? And was there like, is the fear tied to that? Because I... My uncle experienced financial scarcity and so there was fear and there is fear when others see me like going this route like no you're gonna suffer <laughs> so, they're like banging on the window they're like no, yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so how is that like a similar experience for you from from a hundred percent Okay. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So my tia Gelda, um, who I, I really consider her like my grandma because I, I never got to meet my grandma because she, you know, passed when my mom was so young. But mm -hmm. so she was the head of our matriarch and she would bring in healing. She would do all of this stuff. And she ha always had a tough time making ends meet. But mm -hmm. she lived in Sedona and she worked with, you know, spiritual healing. But needed help on some levels you know and then so coming from like my dad who was like go to college become an accountant it's the only way to survive you know we just have to like keep showing up for ourselves and choosing ourselves and having boundaries of who has access to us and you know maybe sometimes even restricting not everyone gets to know everything about us and what we're doing and and, you know, celebrating our wins, finding our people who are like, yeah, you are good at that. Yeah, you should do that. And just creating successful representation. That's yeah. what I feel like, you know, we get to do now. And we get to have, you know, different resources or even different structures um, rather than, you know, relying on, like, capitalism. Like, there's got to be a different way. We have to, like, envision how this supports mm -hmm. us all. And I see that through matriarchal healing. You know, like, everyone eats, you know, when we realize, mm -hmm. oh, you have that? Oh, I have some of this. Here, I can bring some of this, and you can share this. And, and I see it in the chart. I see it, you know, within certain placements. And, like, those are my people. We realize the value of our resources and resource sharing and mutual aid. And we see the end of these outdated, capitalistic, oppressive structures, you know? So yeah. it's, yeah, choosing ourselves and helping others and not everyone's always going to understand that. And that's okay. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's the good news. Times are changing. So the opportunities do too. And 
the inner work is always, I think, like the underlying baseline, right? That can lead us to a different outcome, let's say. Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, I um, want to ask you about resources that might have helped you through your journey in case someone is resonating with your story and wants to check them out. But before I do, is there anything else that um, you want to mention about your journey that I might have missed or not asked about? Well, I always feel um, just awkward being seen or being heard. So I already feel like I've overshared. <laughs> <laughs> so now I have to just like work through that shame spiral. Um, but you know, like just, yeah, just sharing things helps other people share things and be seen. And so I just want to express that like, it's always not easy to be seen, but by doing so, that's where we find our connections. That's where we find our people. And we're always rewarded when we show up for ourselves authentic, like authentically. And that's where we find people who are looking for us. So yeah. just wanted to like make space for that as well. Yeah. If you guys are listening, do me a favor. If hearing Kara's story helped you today in any way, can you message her? I'm going to link her socials in the description. But reach out to her. Let her know what I think helps us in this journey as we feel vulnerable and as we're being seen is gathering that evidence that what we're doing is helpful to others and that it is needed. So please, please, please do me that favor. Make sure you either comment it wherever you're like tuning in or send her a direct message or me and I'll relay the message. What for what? Thank you, thank you, thank you. And and it's true, like I've been doing this work for years and people, when they, you know, come to me, whether they've been following me for a minute on social media or a friend of a friend was like, you have to get a reading with them, you know? I think I am I always feel so grateful that every single person I connect with, with work, it's always faded. And so I think it's quality over quantity, you know, like every single person I have a deep connection with. And so I'm so grateful for that because I, I even think like if I was them, I would be scared just like booking an appointment and like, you know, mm -hmm. having a remote session with someone. So I yeah. think, you know, it, it's courage all around for, you know, the people showing up, looking into this. And even if they weren't raised with this, you know, and they have more questions or they're working through that shame of what that could mean. So just kind of like giving that, like, thank you, like right back. So. Yeah. All right. So in terms of resources, what is one of your favorite healing or mindful tools? Yay. Okay. So, so many options. I think what I really found helpful was finding mentors during my journey mm -hmm. and go and putting myself out there for diversity scholarships. Because when we see, you know, mainstream healing or spiritual awakenings, we don't mm -hmm. always see ourselves represented. Yeah. And so by, you know, finding communities. And so there's astrology conferences, there's astrology mentors, and it might feel like it's kind of impossible to get in touch or in community because you haven't seen yourself represented there. But I would get, you know, I started to talk, to talk a lot about what I was hoping to do, what I was hoping to find. And so I started working at like a little crystal shop a few years ago. And the owner of that crystal shop would start to send like forward me emails of diversity scholarships and you know diversity scholarships for mentorships or conferences so i think just you know having the courage to share your story and ask for help people want to help you and so even though you know it might not feel like it but the more that you have these conversations follow your intuition and share these things bridges start to form and so for me i put myself in a position where to this day, I'm in like five mentorships. So even though you might not be able to see how you're going to get there, but just, you know, following your path, maybe it's books, maybe it's podcasts. Nowadays, there's like apps that can like, you know, cast your chart for you. And so a tool that I always recommend and that I really love is Chani Nicholas. She's an astrologer and she has a beautiful website that I think it's very visually appealing and kind of a simplistic view of the chart. Mm -hmm. 
And so I think it's easier to digest rather than seeing something like with too many lines and this or that. So I like to share the Chani website and to, you know, cast your chart there and start to get familiar with that. And now she has an app. And it's like the best app ever because it gives you like mini readings and notifications. And so I just always share that resource. I think it's such a beautiful resource. I really enjoy it. Ooh, okay. I'm going to have to check that out. Truly, <laughs> yes. What is a habit that you do for yourself every day? Okay, I'm really glad that you answered that question or you asked that question because I was about to be like, oh, wait, I forgot about this. Um, so, <laughs> I love crystals like I have my Dia pass down some of her crystals to me and so finding time to sit with crystals and setting my intention and noticing like what crystal am I being called to today oh I'm called to this one oh and this helps with you know our creativity and you know blockages and like oh doesn't that make sense that's you know having the reflection the awareness to see what crystals you're drawn to, sitting with them, making offerings to our ancestors. Like before, every time I meet with someone, I use Florida water as an offering to our ancestors. And then I love oracle decks and tarot. So it's a practice for me to pull a card and then journal about it. And then to start taking notes of like, where's the moon right now whenever I journal? And then after you start doing that for a while, you have all this data to look back and to just, you know, align with the moon and healing with the moon or whatever feels right to you. But mm -hmm. crystals, cards, journaling. And one of my decks is an, it's called the I Am Everything Affirmation deck. And when I was deep in my Saturn return, I would pull one of those cards and then I would put it next to like my skincare. And so it was a habit that every time that I would put on rose water and put on moisturizer, I was looking at that I am everything affirmation card. And you know, sometimes it's just, I am safe, I am able to ground, I am able to express myself and just kind of like rewiring my brain and putting those words at the front of my mind. I would find myself in situations where maybe normally I wanted to, you know, go off about this or that, but instead I would choose to be like, you know what, everyone's on their own journey, and you know, just kind of like rewiring, realigning, um, yeah. oils, working with the senses, just like all that, gets, coming at it from all angles, you know. Yeah. What is a favorite song to listen to when you need to feel inspired? Ooh, anything Kelly would she use? Like, Ooh, just, okay. yeah, uh huh. There is magic in that music, and yeah. I'll go, like, I'll listen to her playlist and just, you know, just vibe with it, feel it. And then I'm, every now and then I'm like, am I listening to this too much? And I'll try to, like, listen to something else. And I'm like, no, like, it's not here. <laughs> like, I need to, like, feel my, you know, empress energy and, like, move with it in my body. What is a favorite quote or advice that you find yourself um, referring back to? I love this question. Um, I'm also going to look up who wrote it because I have it in, um, I share it a lot. I share it so much that I added it to my workshop. And so I have to celebrate uh, who wrote it. Um, but the quote is, those mountains that you are carrying, you were only supposed to climb. And that I feel like for so many of us who feel like far from home or like we don't fully belong or like we're not enough this and we're not enough that, we are carrying these things from our ancestors that were never even ours to carry. And so just knowing that like we can actually put that down for a moment and like regroup and that, you know, release that surrender, that is where we're able to expand. And so the quote is from Nawa Zebian, a Lebanese Canadian activist, author, and speaker, and educator. And so to say it again, it is these mountains that you are carrying, you are only supposed to climb. The influencer that you follow and that leaves you positively inspired. I like to see influencers who are building community and, you know, celebrating their culture and Anytime I see someone on TikTok, you know, creating community, I follow and I comment. Mm. 
Yeah. And it's like, I don't think putting, you know, influencers on pedestals is going to help. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, seeing ourselves and building community with each other and, you know, the work that you do is so inspiring. I know so many of us have the goal to do these things and create, you know, conversations, um, but it takes a, a lot, you know. So I feel truly inspired by the work that you're doing here and it makes me want to work harder on my podcast. So thank <laughs> you for doing this and showing up. And I know it's not easy, you know, from ideas and deals and you know taking that baton and going forward and creating successful representation like that's what we're here for yeah thank you oh <laughs> i never asked that question to get me but i'm always honored because you're right it is a lot of it is hard work and um i i I recently posted on TikTok. I feel like maybe I think about stuff more than I actually share because I, I think I share more than I do. But I hope in some way I portray that it's not easy, you know, and that it is a journey and that I'm literally just like everyone else who wants to do this. So I'm like working through my own limiting beliefs, my own stuff. Um, and it's so helpful. I've told people like it's so helpful when when people reach out to creators that are making a difference for them. That's so helpful. I used to be like a silent um, consumer, you know, like I never co commented or reached out to people. But I'm so thankful for those that are like, hey, I listened to this episode and this was helpful. And, and I'm like, wow, that literally just gave me energy for tomorrow. You know, like it, it made me want to keep going. So it's super um, it's super helpful on the journey as you're like self-doubting and showing up and doing the thing. <laughs> right. And like so unsure of tomorrow, but then you get like a nice message or, you know, someone just says something kind to you and you're like, okay, it is making a difference. Like I'm yeah. not just talking to a wall here. And I'm mm -hmm. so grateful that a lot of my clients come from TikTok. And, you know, whether they've been following you for a while or, you know, what have you, they're like, oh, this is actually, like, working. Like, we're finding each other. And I'm so grateful yeah. that, like, a lot of my clients are doing such cool things in the world. Like, just within this last week, one of my clients was an immigration lawyer. One of my clients was a Latinx therapist. One of my clients was a Latinx psychologist. And so it's like, they're doing such great things for, you know, people. And then for them to say something nice about me, it like brings me to tears because I'm like, but literally you're like changing the world. So <laughs> just yeah. like always sending that energy right back. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I think that's part of like the what you were saying, that shift in capitalism, right? Like it's giving everyone their flowers and understanding there's room for all of us. And we get to make a difference how... Like, with our gifts, we don't have to do all the things, you know? Like, they're doing their that part, and we're doing this part, and that's, that's part of it. It's, like, community, essentially. Yes, and, like, even... So, I host a community workshop, and so many people in that workshop are creators and are doing the coolest things in the world. And so it's like, okay, well, I understand astrology and patterns and timing techniques, so how can I help you share that message and make sure it reaches, you know, the most people that you're looking to connect with? That's sustainable, you know? Like, without that, it's not sustainable to do this work. And that's where we've seen burnout and things like that. So focusing on sustainability is important. Yeah. Well, maybe talking about your clients, can you let us know where people can follow you, your work, um, your workshops? Let the people know what you're about and what yeah. where they can find you. Definitely. So I am Cara State of Mind on TikTok and on Instagram. And so I would say those are the platforms I'm most active on. I have started a podcast called Cosmic Dia where I share the wisdoms of my theas and just, you know, the stories of what it was like growing up with that magic and then teaching others how to use astrology, whether this is a new tool for you or you're intermediate to advanced. There's just thousands of years of data that, you know, we can get into the deep ends of astrology and how to use it as a tool for reflection and for healing and so that's a big, you know, goal that I have this year is to grow my Cosmic Thea podcast. And I have a website, which is my name, com, 
and that's where you can sign up for my workshops. I have a holistic astrology workshop that I've been doing for a couple years now, and that's where I teach ancient astrology and healing with plants and crystals, and then incorporating modern techniques like goddess asteroids. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's so exciting. Even tarot, like tarot is in alignment with astrology. So sharing mm -hmm. those tools for reflection and resources. Beautiful. Okay, so plenty to choose from. <laughs> There's a lot. Yay. And I don't know if you mentioned, like, do you do natal chart readings um, as well as part oh, yeah. of your services? Okay. Yeah, that would be like a big bulk of my work is to do one on one readings. So people okay. book um, astrology readings with me or tarot or both. But what's so interesting to me is that, like, yes, our natal chart can tell us so much. But then I pull in the current transits, and that is just like the endless, you know, it can tell you mm. certain dates for now. What does this season look like? Why might you be feeling this way? When does this end? If you're planning to do something, let's work with the current transits. Because I think when we read our birth chart, it's kind of obvious. It's like, yes, I do have a problem with authority or whatever those things are. It's like, you know, that's not, not mm -hmm. new information to us. But then pulling in like, well, where is Saturn right now for you? Are you having your Saturn return? Are you having Saturn transits? Like there's so many timing techniques to use astrology and really embody it in your daily life. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Okay, guys. So yeah, I'll make sure to link everything in the description. Ah, all right. So I'm so excited for part two. But I want to give you just an opportunity to, if there's any message you would like to give, I know you mentioned like you're not necessarily first gen yourself, but you do work with a lot of first gens. So if there's like a message that you would like to give those that are listening, I want to give you space for that and then we'll wrap up part one. Yeah, I would say finding community because it can be so exhausting holding everything yourself. And I know a lot of us are warriors and I'm here for it and I love it. But to find yourself in community where, of course, we always want to speak up and we always want to say like, oh, hold on, actually, wait a minute. Like, we exist. Hi. Um, but when you're in community, like for me, it was Pros Before Bros. It's a woman of color book club. And that was the mm -hmm. first time that I was in community with people who, you know, I'm normally very outspoken and normally raise my hand to be like, what about this? What about these people? But that was the first time that people raised their hand before me and would speak. And that feeling of like, oh my gosh, like I don't have to be the one to say it right now. Like I can actually just exist and like listen. That was just so healing. And it allowed me to put something down that I didn't even realize that I was carrying alone. So like, you know, what you do, this is building community. And so finding community to share these things helps us not feel so alone, helps sustain us. And also like sharing, you know, when we've lost people in our family, that's a universal experience. And so many of my clients, whether they've lost someone to death or lost someone to boundaries, but making space for that and removing shame and having a conversation and crying like it's healing it's cleansing so just finding your people where you can be yourself and like take a deep breath and like put something down with that's what sustains us yeah yes well thank you so so much for your time for your story and for your message and yes guys community is so so important um i felt it in my saturn return and <laughs> these are the results of that um so if you have been tuning in and you're not following the podcast already please make sure that you subscribe or click follow or give it a rating and i also want to ask the listeners to let us know their sun sign their moon sign and their rising I think that would be so interesting to see, like, the type of people that tune in to the podcast. All right, guys. Well, thank you so much for tuning in. Remember to share this with your amigas, amigos, amigues. And remember, first gen, that I love you, I love me, and I can't wait for you to love yourself.